when I should throw in the towel with my marriage. You know, a lot of years of struggles and yelling and fighting and smashing things. You or her? Mostly me. My wife specifically is a trigger for that. Every time you smash something, every time you yell, that's the choice you're making. What up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. And I don't know when you're listening to this, but where we're recording this here in Nashville, it is snowpocalypse. I think the, the temperature outside is one. I think it's one degrees outside, maybe zero. And there's snow, and we all crawled and scratched our way into the studio so we could hang out with you today. So glad that you're here. We're talking mental health, marriage, um, emotional health, your physical health, whatever you got going on in your life, kids, schools, all of it. If you want to be on this show, it's real people going through real stuff in their lives. If you want to be on the show, give me a buzz at 1-844-693-3291 or go to johndeloney.com slash ask, A-S-K. And please don't forget, hit that subscribe button. If you can roll over to YouTube and just say, all right, I'll subscribe to this thing. Just hit subscribe. It makes such a big difference for everybody getting access to the show many people who don't even know the show exists. So thank you so much for helping us out. Let's go out to Orlando, Florida and talk to Lance in the pants. What's up, Lance? <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good, man. What's up? Not much. That's literally the first time I've heard Lance in the pants. Oh, I had a buddy named Lance. I called him Lance <laughs> in the pants for like 20 years. It literally just came out. Like, I think it's a part of my yeah. nervous system now. <laughs> so Lance in the pants. What's up? I've heard it a million times. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess um, I guess I'll just start with kind of the question I gave you um, and probably work backwards from there. Um, basically, just wanting to know, like, when I should kind of throw in the towel with with my marriage. Um, it's just been, uh, you know, a lot of years of struggles and yelling and fighting and smashing things so you uh, are I'm just trying to uh mostly me okay um at that, least when it comes to the 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 breaking things um that absolutely yelling, has listen has nothing to do with your marriage zero no I, I i understand that it's something i've been working on for a while okay um and that's kind of one of the one of the problems i feel like my marriage my wife specifically is a trigger for that. It's a uh, bull crap, dude. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. She might know how to push your buttons, but every time yeah. you smash something, every time you yell, that's the choice you're making. Or yeah. if you yeah, can't I make it in that I'm moment, good. you've made the choice to create a world where y'all don't talk. You don't connect. You don't exercise. Your body doesn't feel good. You're not sleeping. You don't have a job that you care to be at that where you feel like you got a purpose and then all that crap comes home. All of those are choices along the way. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I take full responsibility for, for that. Okay. Um, well, you said it, it, she knows how to push my buttons and I feel like she does it a lot. Um, and I've spent probably the last four or five years tell her, you know, I need connection. I need, when we talk, I need you to stay calm and not get ramped up. Um, and that part of it hasn't changed. So I'm just, that's kind of where I'm at with, you know, when do I say this isn't going to change and I need to move on. The, the challenge here is, by the way, you, you quit your marriage whenever you want to quit. I don't think this is a marriage that is unsalvageable. I'll ask you a few questions in a minute and you, you can just kind of cut to the chase for us all. But um, yeah. It's tough when you're somebody who reacts in what I'm going to, I'm going to overuse a word, right? And so I'm going to overdramatize this, but not really. When you react in a violent way, meaning screaming, using your body, you're, you're bigger than she is, is my guess. You're, or maybe taller than her. You smash stuff. You get so angry. And mm -hmm. then you feel shamed about it. You get, you get, you're like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to be cool. And then you come to her and say, hey, when I talk to you, I need you to be calm. I need you to be cool so that we can have these discussions. And her nervous system knows no way in hell am I not going to be fully on guard because who knows what that dude's going to do. Right. And then that sets her 
she's completely on edge. You feel her being on edge. You start to get more and more frustrated. She feels it even more. And so what does she do? She hits you first to create some space, and then you go off. And hitting you first means she pushes your buttons. Yeah. And so the only way forward is, is there has to be a complete, this thing's got to, let me say this. The marriage you had is over. The choice you have is to rebuild one where you're both in on it. And you're going to have to do more than four years of quote unquote, just working on it. You're going to have to do better than that, man. And she's going to have to decide terrifyingly. So to put herself in a position to have something smashed over her again, to be screamed at you have, y'all have little kids. Yeah, we have two little kids, and that's my biggest concern because this stuff has happened right in front of them. Yeah, but man, you 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 say in one sentence, like, I totally own this, but on the other side, you're like, yeah, this kind of stuff just keeps happening in front of them. It's you. You're happening well, in I front don't of mean them. It, yeah, I don't mean it keeps, it, it has happened, and I don't want it to happen anymore. It's Okay, so tell me, tell me what happens in those moments where you can't control yourself. Um... Because she's not on the phone with me. Hey, and before we go, yeah. I, I'm, I'm harping on you. She's not on the phone. And, dude, I know. I've got people in my life that can just cut me to the quick. They know how yeah. to do that, right? People I've been in a relationship with for years and years and years and years and years. Men and women. They can just say the thing that sends me over the edge. <clears throat> and I know that. Well, so I've got some I'll, choices. I'll give you the make. most recent scenario because that's what kind of triggered me to call you. Okay. Um. We were, you know, we were outside. We had a campfire uh, out in our backyard. It was a great night, you know, made s'mores and all that stuff. There was a few moments throughout the night where, like, one of our sons was rolling around on the ground. And my wife was like, don't roll on the ground. There's dog poop or something like that. And I was like, just let him roll on the ground. It's okay. You know, let him be a kid. And then another one came up to us and asked for another s'more. And my wife was like, no. And I was like, just let him have one. It's, you know, we're having fun. Just you know, let it go. So she was like, she was saying she was surprised by me being kind of loose about things, which I do tend to be very tight. You know, when we're in everyday stuff, I like to keep a regular schedule. It keeps keeping a schedule keeps me on track as well. Um, so when the night was over, I was cleaning up stuff outside. She went inside with the kids and I could hear yelling from outside the house. Um, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I came inside and my wife is like, I'm losing my cool. I need you to take over. I was like, fine, I'll take over. No problem. And then my little one is like, starts to turn the TV on. And I'm like, I'm like, no, it's 1030. You know, we'll go read a book. We're not going to watch TV. She came back out and was like, why can't he watch TV? He just, he's got to calm his brain. And I'm like, I don't want him to watch TV. It's, it's 1030. And then she like kind of threw in my face that, you know, you've been so loose all night long and now this, and we went back and forth and it ended up with me getting angry and breaking the chair. Um, <clears throat> but it's those kinds of things. It's like this battle between us with control, I think. Well, let's, re let's reverse engineer this because it's deeper than control. We're going to go backwards. Never freaking break anything in your home again. Got it? Agreed. Cool. Are we done with that crap? Because yeah. that's you acting like a five-year-old. Five-year-olds smash stuff. Yeah. Adults do not. Are you done with that? I am, yeah. I, I want to be. <laughs> no, bull crap. Stop. Walk out the door. Go get a hotel. Don't smash stuff in your house. You're encoding that stuff in your kid's nervous system. Quit. You're terrifying <laughs> your wife. Stop. And then going well, back times where I've do I, I've I've done the walking out the door and you know, I would say, I gotta leave, I'll be back. And then when I get back, I get guilted by my wife for leaving and the kids were upset about me leaving and I'm like, Well, it's one or the other, like yes, I either you're exactly walk away right. from it. It's one or the other. I <laughs> know when I've exceeded my capacity to act like an adult, I'm gonna step out for a minute. And yeah. for the first two, three, five, ten times, your kids are going to go, where did daddy go? Is he coming back? And mom's going to act ir like irrational and be mad and yelling. But you're going to be practicing staying calm in a moment. Yeah. 
right? The adult is running the house, not the child. So the, the description you described to me sounds like, dude, chill out. They're at a fire. He's rolling around in the yard. So what if he gets dog poo? That's how he's going to learn. What I heard yeah. is a woman who is constantly trying to please her husband, who's got a bunch of rules and schedules and regulations. And she, so here's what she's trying to do. A, trying to keep the peace to trying to keep this crazed man calm. And B, in her own weird way, she's trying to love you the best you can. And then you switch it. And my guess is that goes against her nature. And so she feels like she's always having to be the mean parent. And then suddenly, in front of the kids, she's the super mean parent and you become the cool parent. And then there's another instance where... There's a TV on at 1030 at night with a little kid, which, by the way, that does not calm down any child's brain. It spins it up. But then suddenly she's like, well, I want to be the cool parent, which is, is that, is that an, uh, ir- like, an, like a childish response? Yes. Is that understandable? Of course. And here's the deeper problem. Y'all haven't had those talks before they happen. Y'all haven't had like, hey, what are we, how's our parenting approach going to be to screen time? how's our parenting approach going to be to X and Y and Z? Because my guess is you said uh, keeping a schedule keeps you on track. I don't buy that. I think keeping a schedule keeps you in control. I bet your schedule is pretty rigorous, huh? Uh, it's, it's a little crazy, yeah. Okay, so mine is too. But my wife gets up at a different time than me. And my wife actually gets up and writes for an hour. And has a cup of coffee. And she has like a little, like a muffiny cookie thing. Something I, I usually don't ever eat in the morning. We have very different morning routines. Why do you subject your family to yours? I don't, I don't try to subject my family to mine. I, I'm up at five in the morning. I go work out, you know, and my wife isn't usually up until around seven, seven thirty, And she gets our kids ready for school. Then I take our younger one to school. Um, and that part is all fine with me. The part of the problem I have with it is it's not with her. It's not consistent. So it's like, there'll be times I come in for at seven o'clock and she slept through like three alarm clocks and you know, it's 20 after and I'm having to wake her up and say, Hey, I'm going to be late getting our son to school. I need you to get up. So a lot of it feels like parenting her sometimes. And I, I get frustrated with that. One thing I told her a couple months back when we were talking is I feel like I've been pushing our family up a hill for the last 10 years. And it's just, I'm getting worn out. Cause I'm constantly trying to push to keep things moving forward. You ever asked your wife what she wanted? I mean, we sit down and we've had talks with like, she'll tell me I need, I need, um, I need romance. I need, you know, in romance to hers, like little notes here and there or bringing her flowers. And, um, you know, I've done those things not consistently to my, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm not real consistent about it because Again, our schedule gets crazy and I just forget. Um, but it should be, you know, I've like started in the last couple of months putting notes in my calendar to remind me, you know, on Thursdays, pick up flowers or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so we've sat down and had the talks about needs and, you know, wants and stuff like that. I, I've told her many times I need connection from her. And connection for me is like long, deep conversations. And she's just like, well, I, I'm not smart about those things. I can't have those deep conversations. I'm like, I just want to talk. I want someone that I can talk and laugh and have fun with. Um, Are you somebody that every, that every conversation ends up like in some, like a Huberman podcast? Or every com- <laughs> or every conversation ends up in a Doctor Atia podcast. I'm I'm a lot like that. I'll, I'll okay. admit it. I'm, so here's what I'm telling you. Thinker, so. I almost burned out every friend I have over that crap. 
So two things. Number one, I have a coach that I pay an exorbitant amount of money that I meet with on Friday mornings. And we meet for hours. You know, we talk about the craziest scientific, theological, rabbit holy, social psychology stuff in the world. Because I have to have that. And when I worked at a university, I was every lunch was like some theory, some th- some legal scholar talking about talking about this with an anthropologist. I mean, that was my whole life for 20 years, and I missed that. But your wife is right. Every conversation like that feels like she's not enough for you. And you get frustrated, yeah. and she feels her lack of making you frustrated. And so you have to be a grown-up and say, okay, I need this. But this isn't the person for that. When I was taking, when I was taking, when I was at an MMA gym, I needed like that physical contact. Well, that's not my wife, right? She's not going to sit in the living room and fight me. So I had to go somewhere else. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I get it. I want you to listen to your language. I've been pushing my family up a hill. My guess is your wife's tired of getting pushed. Yes, you have, like, I get you feel like you have to parent her. I also often, not all the time, sometimes people are just immature. I don't give a crap. They sleep in through their alarms. They're lazy. They just don't care. There's also people who have just flat given up because they can never do it right. And whenever they try to do it the way you want to do it, it just goes sideways. Or you change the rules or you get mad or you're doing this or what about that? Is that ringing a bell? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds more along the lines for sure. So do you want to end your marriage? And I don't, I don't have a stake in the, uh, my marriage is fine. I don't have, I don't have a, 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 a stake in this. I'm just asking you point blank. Are you done with this marriage? I don't want to be. No, I want to. That's not the question I asked. <clears throat> I don't want to have eaten a bagel for breakfast on. this morning. I <laughs> ate a bagel this morning. I never do that. And I know it's going to cost me. My blood sugar is going to fall off a cliff here in about 45 minutes. I'm asking you. Is your marriage over? I want to keep working on it. I want to keep working on it. Yeah, but you also don't want to smash chairs. Tell me, am I going to work on this or am I not going to work on this? No, I'm going to keep working on it. Okay. The path forward I see for you is, and you're not going to like this. I feel like I've said this three or four times the last uh, several shows. And I I don't think I've ever said this before up until now. Is that you find somebody to watch your kids. And you blow off your 5 a.m. workout for the next morning. And one night you take your wife out to dinner early. And you hold both of her hands across the table. Or you send your kids to a babysitter somewhere else's house. And you do it at your house. And you take a knee in front of her. And you just say, hey, I'm sorry. I've been pushing you up a hill. I've been trying to create this thing in my head. And you and I could go down a rabbit hole. My guess is you're running from something. I don't know what you're trying to hold together so firmly or what picture you're trying to solve for, but your attempt to make everything perfect in your home is destroying your home. Yeah, you could probably make a career out of me. <laughs> There's a lot going on. <laughs> well, it's, it, here's the thing. You're doing it right. And what I mean by that is, My guess is you went through hell growing up and you have found a way to solve for that. And that is systems and control and strength and, and, and discipline and determination. Fair? Yeah. Cool. That works on a David Goggins podcast. It does. It works in his real life. Doesn't work in 99.9999999% of marriages. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to stay married and you want to keep your family together, tell your wife, I'm sorry. I acted like a child when I scream at you. I act like a child when I smash things. That will never, ever happen again. I've been trying to force a life on you. I never asked you what you wanted in this life, what you felt like. Here's an exercise I want you all to explore. How do you want your home to feel when you walk home from walk in from work every day? How does your wife want the house to feel when she opens her eyes up in the morning? 
Because my guess is that alarm goes off and her body says, don't get up. <clears throat> don't get up. How do you want, yeah. do you want I've, your kids I've to... I've heard you say that before. And just to, like after that fight, I did leave for, the, for a night. I went to a friend's house and stayed there. And when I came back, like I told her, there was just this feeling like it was like a two hour drive and an hour there. I just had this feeling like a backpack, a heavy backpack was just taken off. Cause that was the day, that was the night I told her or the day I told her I want a divorce. And like, I don't think I really meant that at the time, but it was, I just didn't know what else to say to stop the, the fight we were having, the conversation we were having. And so I left for a friend's house and I just felt this relief that I haven't felt in a long time. And what do you know about feelings? Uh, what do you mean by that? Feelings are designed to keep you safe. They don't tell the truth. Yeah. There's probably a sense of relief that you didn't smash somebody this time. Because that day's coming, my friend. When you're going to be leaning over somebody you love. Because you think it's bad now. Your kids haven't started really coming after you. When they get in first, second, third, fourth, middle school. My fear is on your trajectory, you're standing over somebody you love. And they're curled up in a fetal position with their face busted up. Because that's where you're headed. Yeah, that's. What I went through as a kid, and I don't want to exactly. Do that. So I need you to hear me say with all certainty, 100% certainty, the thing you are trying to achieve through radical discipline, through everybody doing everything right, through turning your family into a military unit, is actually starving your body from what your body needs. Because if you got the crap beat out of you as a kid, your body's still wondering as a five-year-old, why are you hitting me? I'm a kid. And that's that ferocious rage that comes out when you find yourself smashing a chair after a pretty good night with your family. That's the fit, yeah. That's the five-year-old. That's the fifth grader still trying to defend you. The difference is your wife's not throwing punches like your old man did. And until you decide, and this dude, this word sucks, I hate it, I hate it with all my heart, and it's the truth, until you decide to open yourself up to actually let this woman hurt you, that's the only way she can actually connect with you. That's the only way you can save your marriage. It's called vulnerability. And that's beyond writing little notes. Her writing little notes is proxy. That's her begging Will you just think of me one time over your stupid calendar, please? Over your workout program, please? That's what she's asking. Yeah. Do I even enter your mind until you get home? Or am I just an employee of yours that you think about when you walk in and you're looking to inspect my performance? And does this mean she's perfect? God, no. No way. But she's not on the phone. the things I can do, you know? What you need to do is tell your wife you're sorry. And I would list very specifically how you've hurt her. And it's not, and you made me, she's not made you do one damn thing, dude. She's never made you smash a chair. You did that. She's never once made you raise your voice. You chose that. And until you take full ownership of that, it's going to be this tit for tat thing. Now, you're bigger and louder than she is. You probably have made her parent a certain way. You've probably made her clean a certain way. Now, she could always leave, but that's different. So I'd be very specific, and then I would let her know, I have signed up. I'm going to see a counselor in my community to deal with my childhood abuse. The time of running and flexing is over. I'm going to deal with it. That's the only way you can save your marriage, my friend. That's it. That's it. I wish there was another way. That's it. And I think that relief you felt was this, A, an illusion that, oh, the responsibilities are gone. That's very, very temporary. 
But I also think that relief was your body saying, ooh, thank God, because we were holding back from doing something really bad. And I'm telling you right now, you need to go seek professional help to deal with that inner rage. And for especially men and women, yes, but especially little boys who are physically abused from some tough guy dad or that tough guy mom for that, for that instance, that shame will haunt you and your family forever until you say, I'm done. And I'm done isn't just flexing through every hard conversation and try not to hit a hole through the sheetrock. I'm done is sitting with a counselor and saying, I'm letting this crap go. I'm not letting that abuse run my life anymore. I love you, man. Call me anytime, and I'll be honest with you. I'll, I'll shoot it to you straight. I actually think your marriage can be saved, and not only saved, but I think it can grow into something pretty amazing. The thing that your body has been desperately screaming and searching and running for all these years. But you're gonna have to start over from square zero, from 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 step zero. And your wife's gonna have to be all in too. That means both of you are gonna have to be very vulnerable, and that's gonna be scary for a while. We'll be right back. You know, I'm always talking about sleep. What I don't talk about enough is the role temperature plays in deep, restorative, and powerful sleep. And the problem in my house, and I'm sure it's like yours, is that I like it really cold, and my wife likes to sleep on burning coals. And for me to get it cold, I have to crank down the air conditioner, often even in the winter, and it's wasteful, expensive, and it drives everyone else bonkers. But the gurus at 8 Sleep did it. I'm so excited that 8 Sleep is partnering with the Dr. John Deloney Show to take care of our listeners and ultimately change your marriage and change your life. Our friends at 8 Sleep have created a fitted sheet with cooling and heating technology embedded in them. It's called the 8 Sleep Pod, and the pod cover can easily be added to your existing mattress like a fitted sheet for individualized temperature adjustments, down to 55 degrees for people like me and up to 110 degrees for people like my wife. And this is based on your environment, your body temperature throughout the night, and it cools down or warms up each side of the bed. It learns you, and it does all this automatically. And this will improve your sleep quality like you have to experience to believe. The 8 Sleep Pod also has built-in vibration alarms that wake you up when it's time, gradually changes the temperature of your mattress to gently wake you up, and it can even provide sleep and health reports, like heart rate, HRV, and all those things. And you don't have to wear anything. This is the ultimate sleep experience. Go to 8sleep.com to read more, learn more. I challenge you to go read about this. It's amazing. See if you want to change your sleep and change how you show up in your life. That's E-I-G-H-T-S-L-E-E-P, 8sleep.com slash Deloney or enter promo code Deloney at checkout for up to $400 in savings. Check them out. All right, let's go out to Detroit. Man, home of the Lions that are just crushing it right now. Let's talk to Kayla. What's up, Kayla? Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. You're good. You're in good hands. What's up? Um, so I guess my main question was that I've recently become an alcoholic and I'm not quite sure how it happened or why, I guess. <laughs> I don't know that that's the most important thing right now. No, it's not. But, um, I know I need to deal with it. And okay. I'm also working on that too. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, I'm just started recently going to therapy. Um, I gave my husband all my cards and stuff so that way I don't have access to buy it. Are you spending, well, back, back me up here. What happened? How, how, I mean, how do we get here? Um, well, I guess, it's only been really like strong for the last six months. Um, but it kind of, I think it started when we moved out here. Uh, my husband kind of went through a deep depression phase and I kind of had to pick up the slack of everything in the house and it kind of just became overwhelming. And after a year of doing that, I slowly started drinking to 
make myself feel better. And it just got worse and worse and worse over time. <laughs> okay. Um, so in your case, alcohol works, man. Because your home life sucked. It was really tough. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's not like PC to say, but being married to somebody who's in a dark depression and can't get out of bed and you're taking care of everything. Do you all have kids? Yes, we do. Okay. So you're doing everything, 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 plus worried about the electric bill, plus worried about things that y'all had not previously agreed were your, part of your job description, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a history of alcoholism in your family? Um, unfortunately, yes. One of my uh, sisters has died from it. My mother has died from it. Oh, and has died my dad from it? was an alcohol alcoholic. Yes. So you are playing with fire. Yes. Yeah. And then, like, I, I know that, and I don't want to do it, but it's just, like, there's something in me that I just can't, like, I, I know. I know. get past. It's a, it's a demon. I know. I promise there's light on the other side, but right now it is scary, scary, scary. It is. Because you told yourself this would never happen to you after walking with your sister's death, your mom's death. You you swore up and down. And the challenge here is, yes, you're drinking and yes, you're scared to death. And yes, it's like becoming easier and easier. Have you had a drink today? No, not not yet. Okay. But <laughs> right when you get off this call, you will to calm down because you're nervous, right? I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to be mad at you. Yes. Okay. Um, not only is that the case, but you swore to yourself it would never happen to you. And so you've lost trust in Kayla. Mm-hmm. Is that fair? Absolutely. So I think we can get to the why. It sounds like your childhood was hell on earth. Fair? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then your body, for lack of better terms, you've married your unfinished business and you married somebody with some similar mental health challenges and you're going to solve it. And suddenly you realized, oh, I can't solve this. And your body was like, ah, I got a plan for when we can't solve a problem. Both genetic Bad <laughs> and behaviorally, right? You're in it, you're in it up to your eyeballs. Yes. There's one plan and one plan only. You got to go scorched earth. Because you're going to die. <clears throat> if I'm you, if you're my sister, if you're my wife, if you were one of my closest, closest friends, I would tell you, I don't see a path forward without you going to an inpatient treatment right now before this thing gets the train completely leaves the station. The fact that you haven't drank this morning before this call, that's a good, I'm taking that as a good sign because you're nervous up until now, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> did you drink last night so you could sleep before today? Yes, I did. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's grown on you like a Dementor, right? Like a shadow coming up behind you. Yeah, it does. How's your husband right now? Can he handle things for for a, a for a, a few weeks? Uh, he absolutely could. Okay. Um, he has tried getting me to do inpatient treatment. What's your, um, what's your hesitancy? Uh, I I have very bad anxiety with not being around my kids. Okay. <laughs> I know that he could take care of them. I was just leaving them for that amount of time. It's just stresses me out. <laughs> and then have you heard me talk about anxiety? Yes, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> have you taken that anxiety test? Yes, and I got red on every every spot. Every one of them? Every single one. All right, what's my cornerstone rule about anxiety? Which Oh, you're going to have to Do what? Oh, was, you're just going to have to tell me. <laughs> okay. My cornerstone rule. All right, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in nerd speak. Okay. When you feel anxious about a thing and you walk away from that anxiety, meaning I know that if I don't go to inpatient rehabilitation, I am going to die. 
and my kids will experience what I experienced when my mom died. The guilt, the pain, the hell. But your body feels anxious about leaving your kids because in some ways you're worried about your husband's ability to care for them and in some ways they've become a pacifier to you. They're a Xanax for you. They're one glimpse of light in a pretty dark world, fair? Yes. Yes. So it's less about are they going to be okay and it's more about are you going to be okay? And when you feel that anxiety, you run and you hug those kids. And here's what happens. Your body actually reinforces the anxiety. It makes it stronger because it got what it wanted. It worked. And what it wants is for you not to get any further away from the light as possible. And those two little kids are all the light you got. And my cornerstone rule, and it's not my rule, it's neuroscience. The only way to get those, that anxiety to stop is to head directly into it. You're anxious about leaving your kids for 30 days? I'm going to sprint towards that. You anxious about um, how your husband's going to be able to handle it? We're going to sit down and we're going to make a plan. Are you anxious about waking up dead? Like your mom, like your sister, like your aunt? I'm going to make a committed plan that that never happens to me. You see what I mean? This is changing your posture. This is you standing up tall for the first time in your life and putting your chin up and your shoulders back and saying, I'm heading right into this. And then you realize, I can't walk into this by myself. It's too scary. I've been there. I know. And you've got a husband who's saying, hey, will you go get this taken care of? Because I don't want to bury you. you got two little kids looking at you. You've got the ghosts of your mom saying, honey, take care of this, take care of this, take care of this. How does that all sound? Besides really, really scary. Um, I don't even know. It's just scary. It's just scary. <laughs> it is. Um, yeah, man, and I know I need to do it. Okay. Let this be the day. And listen. Your body's going to crave this one thing. If you've heard me talk about anything, read anything I've written, I always am talking about homeostasis. Your body's going to want to go back to what it knows. It knows alcohol. It knows chaos. It knows anxiousness. It knows somebody who said he's going to love you ends up in a really dark place. It's what your body knows. And so rehab for you, A, it's going to be not drinking, right? But bigger mm -hmm. than that, it's going to be you learning a new way to live. And that sounds scary, but doesn't that sound freaking amazing? It does. It does. Like imagine walking in your front door and you just start laughing when you get home and your knucklehead kids come running up to you and your husband's on the couch and you're like, oh God. <laughs> but the heat is on. And your husband's hung up Christmas lights somewhere in the house. and uh, Who knows? Whatever, whatever fantasy you have in your head. I want you to know you can build that. You can't do any of it if you're drinking. Is it unfair that you got this deck of cards? Yeah, it is. I didn't get that deck of cards. I eat when I'm stressed. I don't drink. But that's the card you got, and that's the card you got to deal with. Will you make that call today? Yes. Yeah. Do you promise? I do. Okay. I'm going to have Kelly put a note on the calendar. In 30 days, we're going to reach back out to you. Okay. Okay. This is going to be absolute hell. Okay? Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. And... The light and peace on the other side of this thing is going to be something you have never experienced before in your life. And you have an entire country of people behind you on this one. But by the way, we don't matter. The person who matters is your husband. The people who matter are your kids. The person that matters is the woman standing in the mirror. So proud of you, Kayla. Tonight, after you make that call and say, I'm ready to go, actually first tell your husband, then tell, um, make the call. 
then I want you to shoot us an email and just say, hey, I'm checking in tomorrow morning at whatever time, at whatever location, whatever inpatient treatment. And we'll send you something nice over there. I'm really, really proud of you, Caleb. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Man, I'm proud of you. We'll be right back. New Year's is my favorite time of the year. And this year, I'm committed to finally establishing an ongoing journaling routine, developing a consistent and guided daily prayer practice, as well as getting back to meditating and doing my coherence breathing exercises on a daily basis. One place where I can do all of this in the same location is with my favorite app in the world, Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app on planet Earth. It has over 10,000 audio guided prayers, meditations, and music. I use the guided prayers and scripture readings for my personal development. I listen to the lo-fi beats while I journal. I'm a sucker for good lo-fi. And occasionally when things get sideways, I return to the app in the afternoon for peace throughout the day. Whether you're a person of Christian faith who is looking to renew your way of living or you're curious about all this faith talk and you just want to explore, Hallow is for you. For listeners of the Dr. John Deloney Show, you get three free months of Hallow, all 10,000 plus prayers, meditations, music, the lecture series, and more, all of it, by going to hallow.com slash Deloney. That's three free months of the app at hallow.com slash Deloney. All right, we're back. Let's go across the big pond and talk to Sophie in London. What's up, Sophie? Hi there, Dr. John. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Of course. Thanks How for calling are you? in. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's freezing here, but the sun is shining, so that's great. How about you? It's freezing here, and it's pitch dark. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The land of sadness. What's up? No, no sunshine here. <laughs> well, I'll try, to be, I'll try to be all the sunshine you need for today. So what's up? Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I, if it's okay, I'll, I'll give a bit of context first, because otherwise my question makes no sense. Um, so, um, essentially, uh, through my whole working life, um, I've been really well known for working well over my contracted hours. Um, I've been in my current workplace for three years. Um, my managers have really recognized that uh, that I work far too long, um, and they really, really tried to encourage me to change that. Um, which I've really resisted um, till recently. But I have, um, since just before Christmas, really tried hard to pull my hours back. And um, I'm suddenly experiencing a lot of um, anxiety um, to the point of um, extremely embarrassing. Uh, I'm having panic attacks at work. And um, so I'm in the process of finding a counsellor and um, I'm working on my self-care routine as well. But I'm wondering if you had any other advice. And ultimately, I need to sort of communicate all of this to my colleagues um, and my managers. Um, that I'm really, really trying. Um, but yeah, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm so proud of you. What you're talking about is the curse of the Western world. And... It sounds like your body reached a place that mine reached about, it was about 10 years ago when my body said, Hey, I've been trying to get your attention for so long. I quit. <laughs> right. Cause if I don't quit, yeah, I'm hoping it doesn't quit. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's it, basically like one of your tires has fallen off. That's what a panic attack is. That's when your body's like, Oh, you're not getting this message. <laughs> so we're just going to start shutting the system <laughs> down. Right. Yeah. So, um, Man, this would be, you would be somebody who I'd love just to go have a drink with and sit for a couple of hours. Cause my guess is you've got a long story. It's a, it's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> remarkable. Is that fair? Um, I don't know. I talk about work a lot, so I'd probably bore you to tears. <laughs> okay. So let me, let me just cut to it. What does, um, work is your drug. And so my friend, you've heard, heard me say this. If you ever listened to the show, my friend Ian Simpkins, he lives right down the street mm -hmm. here. Uh, he says, if, busyness is your drug rest will feel like stress so you've put your mm -hmm. entire identity into work hours in production even to the point that now it's you were that fun kid at the bar who everyone loved having around because you would always have one or two drinks too many and you were hilarious you do the funny thing you would just go kiss the dude at the bar like you were the fun friend and now your friends are like hey dude you gotta slow down that's your bosses. Do you realize what a crazy thing when your boss is like, hey, you got to quit working. 
No boss says that, right? <laughs> no, it's a standing joke. So what's, what is what is work allowing you to hide from in your life? That's a very good question that I wish I had a, a, a solid answer for. I don't really... Uh, I don't really know, and, and I'm aware that's something that I probably need to, to kind of... I think you do. Through. I think you do. I think you don't want to say it. What is your body trying to protect you from? Is it going home to an empty house? Is it loneliness? Are you married? Do you have kids? Uh, I have a partner. No kids. Okay. Uh, foster cat. Um, so uh, going home to the foster cat. Um, my partner, when he's, when he's home, cause he works weird shifts. Um, yeah. Here's what, yeah, here, here's what working a lot thing. did for me. I didn't know how to be a husband. I didn't know what I was doing. In the first four or five years I was married, I just got a clear message. I was doing it wrong and I didn't know what to do. And I opened up my toolkit to try to fix, quote unquote, fix my marriage. And there was just a hammer in there. That's it. I mean, I didn't know what to do. And, but one thing I did know how to do was go work. And so I took extra jobs yeah. and extra shifts. And then I got a pat on the back initially. And then I got some extra money in my account initially. And then my wife could do some cooler yeah. things and it felt right. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I, <laughs> you saying saying that I, I, you don't, um, you uh, didn't know how to be a, a husband. I, I, I don't know how to be a, a person who goes home or a person who stops working. Um, I, I just, so I, I like to be occupied. Yeah, but, but what is your body so terrified from? Did you grow up with scarcity growing up? Did you have food insecurity growing no. up? Uh, food insecurity, um, very, um, very fortunate, very aware of my privilege. Okay. Did, um, did, um, was achievement the way that your dad patted you on the head or your mom? Or did you come up in a really safe, wonderful environment? Often, uh, often without meaning to, very high achieving, very um, well meaning parents really do a dance when they're straight A's. They really do a dance when um, there's more money being made. That's really interesting. Because over time, and, and by the way, this isn't a moral failure. This gets encoded in your nervous system. Your body begins to understand through biochemical processes yeah. that the way to connection, the way to love those that are most important to me when you're a kid, it's the adults in your life is achievement, busyness, earning money, getting grades, getting into the right schools, getting the right marks. Mm. That's interesting. I remember something my dad said to me that um, uh, I got exam results through and I got like 98 out of 100. And his response was what happened to the other two. Oh man, we're more similar than you think, Sophie. Uh, my dad and him and I have laughed about this. Um, I got one B. I think it was my first semester in college, maybe my second semester in college. I got one B. I was so ex I was I was thrilled, right? Because I was kind of a mess. Actually, my first semester of college, I don't think I did great. <laughs> second semester, I was like, dude, I, this is school, and I'm smarter than this. I gotta I gotta put some effort into this, and I got all A's and one B. And my dad's first response was. Huh, would have killed you to just get one more? And I remember mm. that, like, that deflated feeling. And he wasn't meaning that at all. I think he was completely kidding. Mm. But he didn't have the tools to go, hey, you've turned this thing around. I'm proud of you. He didn't have that. His dad didn't do that. And his, my, dad, my granddad's dad died when he was 10. So he didn't have that skill set, right? But I, I learned early on, oh, you will achieve. Yeah. It's interesting because even my parents are like, you work ridiculous hours and you should really like, of course, try to leave the office. So um, you've heard me talk about it's, anxiety it's, a lot. It's essentially everyone. Yeah. Yeah. 
Everyone who cares about you is watching you die. And there's something inside of you that is so terrified of being alone with Sophie that you will do anything, even up into death, to avoid dealing with Sophie. Or dealing is probably dramatic, just being with. Your body has identified stillness, a cup of tea in the morning. Just asking your partner to, to take the morning off and let's just go for a walk, even though it's pitch black outside. Your body has put a GPS pin in that that says danger, 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 danger. We got to stay working. And I'm telling you, the only way through that is to go directly into that anxiety. There's not another path. You can't go around it. And self-care routine-y kind of things, that is just Band-Aids on top of it. It just is. Anyone who's like, well, you should just have a warm cup of tea and take a hot bath. Just walk away from them. This is deeper than that. This is encoded in you. Oh, no, 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 When I, when I say like self-care routine, I'm meaning making sure that I go for a walk at lunchtime, get some fresh air. Okay. But it, it's, it's um, way bigger than that. Which in itself is, which in itself is torturous. It is, it is. Leaving my death. But, I, but I'm talking, it's bigger than that. This is you saying, um... I will only work eight hours today and I will put a thing on my computer that shuts my computer off at the end of eight hours. And I'm going to feel so anxious. I'm not going to know what to do with my hands. I'm not, my body's going to go <gasps> and I'm going to head directly into that feeling, not flip the computer back up, work my way around that software program and then get back to it. My phones will go off at 6 p.m. period. I will not turn them back on, period. And I'm going to feel that sense of powerlessness. I'm going to own it. And only then can you ask yourself, what do I actually want to do right now? Because here's my problem, and you probably experience this too. I love working. I like it. Yeah. Like, I actually like it. And you have to think of it like alcohol. Like, it's okay to like having a drink. It's okay to like having two. And then it will kill you. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I think so. But I don't think you want to. Please tell me. Tell me, tell me. I'm so curious because I know that you know. What are you scared of? I think you know. What is it? Don't know who. Say it. It's like I don't know. It's sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, don't be sorry at all. This is hard stuff. It's like I don't know who I'm going home to. Yeah. Is your partner safe? Yeah. That means no. That's a really bad. That's a really bad answer. No, it's not. It's, <laughs> um, a, it's an oh, uh -uh. no. You can't walk it back now. You already said it. like it's a truthful answer, it's not a bad answer. You can't be mostly safe because that means you're not safe. And now it makes perfect sense to me why your body has said you will go to work and you will stay at work. And you will keep working and then you will keep working on top of that. And your bosses are like, oh my gosh, Sophie, go home. And your parents are like, honey, go home. And your body's saying, we can't. Are you going to love Sophie enough to go be safe? Uh, 
Sorry, I'm trying to order the words in my head. And the... No, don't, don't. Just speak. Um, just speak. I don't think I realised till you asked the question. I know, it's scary. I want you to do something you probably haven't done in a long time. And instead of fighting your body, fighting that need to go work, finding that need to not be in your home, I want you to flip the whole script. Put your hand in your chest and ask yourself this question. What if my body's right? What if the safest place for me on planet Earth is at a work environment where, God, what amazing bosses you have. They're even caring about you outside of here. They care about your mental and physical health and well-being. <laughs> There's not a lot of bosses on planet Earth that act like that. That's very true. That is very true. You still have mom and dad. That ah uh, man, they probably yeah. man. If, if 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 they could do it over, of course they would change some things. But they still care about their baby girl. And then you go home to a dragon. You don't know if he's going to be a sleeping dragon or if there's going to be everything's going to be on fire. So here's the deal. I'm not going to put you on the spot because I know this is hard. And if you've never thought about this before, it can be really overwhelming inside your body. I'm going to ask, please, please call somebody today and go get in and go see somebody. And in your situation, I don't really care what the cost is because you're not safe physically. Okay? Fair? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, it sounds to me like your body's working perfectly. And in a strange way, thank God it's chosen work as the avenue of safety over some sort of substance, over some sort of um, thrill-seeking behavior. <sighs> and I'm going to say this too. I don't know that your colleagues at work need to know the insights of all of what's going on in your life. Maybe they're safe enough and you can tell them. But if you're in an abusive situation, you've got to go find a place for your body to be safe. And you, if you ever listen to this show for more than two episodes, you know I don't ever tell people to end a relationship. Get out. I'm telling you. Get out. If he's not safe, get out. It's the only way your body's going to let you breathe. We love you, Sophie. We're here anytime you want to call. Reach out anytime. Any resources we got for you, whether it's financial uh, support or whether it is uh, with, through the, the Total Money Makeover stuff and financial peace or it's any of the books, anything we can do to help you, let me know. We got you. I think it's time to ask yourself, where can I go and be safe? God, I know this is hard. You deserve to be safe. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Deloney here. Listen, you and me and everybody else on the planet has felt anxious or burned out or chronically stressed at some point. In my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, you'll learn the six daily choices that you can make to get rid of your anxious feelings and be able to better respond to whatever life throws at you so you can build a more peaceful, non-anxious life. Get your copy today at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back. Man, Kelly, today's show got heavy, heavy, heavy. It did, real fast. Yeah, real like, fast. On some things I wasn't expecting. Yeah. That Based on what the email we got in, we're like, oh, okay, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, when I, y'all y'all send me like a little scratch, like, hey, it's going to be kind of about this. And yeah, man, hey, and again, I want to reiterate this to all the listeners. Just ask yourself, what if my body's right? If you take the anxiety test, we'll link to it in the show notes here. If you take the anxiety test, um, 
and it says like most of your life is red. It did that to me. After I released the book on building a non-anxious life, I took my own anxiety test. And it was like, <laughs> it was like five out of six were red. And I was like, ah, yeah, there we go. And it was right. It was 100% right. I quit doing a lot of things. So get back on the horse, get back on the horse, get back on the horse. But ask yourself, what if my body's right? What if my body's right? All right, as we wrap up the show, Kelly, you said you found something on the internet. I did. I found this story last night, and I thought it was just kind of neat, so I wanted to read it real quick. A woman um, posted, I'll read most of it, I'll paraphrase some of it. She said, I want to tell a story. When I was in the third grade, I went with my mom while she dropped off some drugs. Anyway, she sent some guy, left me in the car and sent some guy out to quote unquote watch me. And it's just me and this guy. He looks over and says, you don't know what a haiku is, do you? And I responded, yeah, it's a Japanese poem consisting of three lines in a pattern of 575. I remember I had just written one in class. He freaked out and told me I was the smartest person he'd ever met. I was eight. Anyway, on that day, he vowed to make sure I made it to school. My own mother was in her own world doing and dealing drugs. And I tell you, this guy made sure I made it to school every day. He picked me up every day and then did homework with me. Whoa. He took me to all the important things in my life. He became my family, the closest thing to a father figure I had ever known. He was my best friend. He saved my life. And so she's telling this because the night that she wrote this, she got a call that he had passed away. Uh. He'd had a heart attack. So she says, anyway, he's gone, and I'm probably going to be weird for a while. I'm sorry in advance. I just need to put this out there. Um, she said, she, she, say, she goes on to thank him and tell him, she said, thank you for teaching me how to change a tire, replace my brakes, watch every o- episode of The Simpsons with me, and literally save my life countless times. This is what he told me, and this is the important part right here. You can literally, or you can have a good life in spite of your mom, or you can have a bad one because of her. And Ooh, I thought man. that was such an interesting quote right there because we talk about people all the time. The lady in the second call, for instance, who has this family history, but you can do it in spite of them or have a good one or have a bad one because of them. And I thought that was very, very powerful. Yes. And that because is a much more eloquent way of what I try to tell people, set the backpack down. Like you can keep carrying that sucker and get your knees and hips replaced or you can just set it down. And it sounds so trivial, but dude. And by the way, everybody listening, when you feel like we're entering into an election season and you feel completely powerless and the Middle East is setting off more and more and more and more. And it looks like this one's going to cascade into a big one. And you feel powerless. There's a little kid on your block that needs someone just to show up. There's a little kid on your block that needs someone just to throw a football. There's your own kids in your house that need you to be an adult. There's a school that needs volunteering. There's an extra shift you can grab at work because a single mom that you work with needs to be at home with. There are ways to serve everywhere, right? Yeah, and like this girl right here in particular, she is a doctor. Um, and She went through med school? Yeah, so Good think God. about, had this guy not come out, think about what her life could have been. Her mother was dealing and doing drugs, but because of this one guy came out and asked her a stupid question about a haiku and then showed up. Yeah, just kept showing up. And made sure that her life was different. How one person, I mean, he changed her life. And now all the countless patients and right. families she's impacted because that one dude because, out of a drug house. Right, came out and said, she needs better. She and let's just call it the other important thing. Learn what a haiku is, people. Five, seven, five. Pay attention to iambic pentameter. These are important things. No one's ever asked me in a dark alley what the... Uh, Square root of a triangle is, it could happen, and you could end up in med school. Parents, show this part of the show to your kids. <laughs> Only this part, but show this part to your kids. Kids, you never know when mom's going to be <laughs> dropping off drugs and a guy's going to get in your car and ask you a hard question, and it's going to change the course of your life. So here's the other weird question. How'd you get your daughter to write this question in, Kelly? Kelly? No, too soon. I ruined a beautiful story, didn't I? You did. You I had to far. go there. I went too far. I know. Dang. All right, I'm going to retract that statement. I'm going to self-edit. I'm going to slap it up, flip it, and reverse it. And thanks for playing that, Kelly. That was a beautiful st- uh-huh. story. Yep, sure. That was awesome. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye. <laughs>